Today on Between the Lines, there's an old saying that goes, curiosity killed the cat. But for us humans, it just might be a lifesaver. And my guest, Becky Saltzman, is a curiosity expert. Welcome, I'm Barry Kibrick. Becky spent the last two decades exploring how curiosity is used as a guide to finding our true selves. With her book, Living Curiously, she shows us how to uncover our blind spots in order to make better decisions and in turn lead a more fulfilling life. I'm a writer today because I was a reader when I was 11 years old. And it was you, do need to, need, you do not need to prove your state of happiness to anybody. Most of these speeches were as much as a month in preparation. The characters, the heroes in this book are seekers of truth in, in a story that, that involved a lot of corruption. You don't get a chance to really talk about what's real. And that is the first thing to do. Becky, it's a pleasure. Welcome to Between the Lines. I'm so glad you made it from Oregon to, is it Oregon? I believe it is, to down here. Thank you, Becky. Thank you for having me. I love your show. I'm very excited. Well, you know, I was joking before in the green room with you, but the truth is it wasn't really a joke. I said, you are now making a living, living curiously. I am, I am, and helping people use curiosity to do great things. Well, as you say in the book, what the main thing it does, oh, well, that's not, if it was only this thing, we wouldn't be having a show. We're going to go through everything. But what it does is it helps you uncover, these are your words, what you need to know to make better decisions and find hidden connections that reveal insights. And we're going to go through how that works and plays out as we go. But that's the basis of what this does. It really allows you to uncover the truths and sometimes the non-truths that you may be living with. Yeah, I mean, it's really true. We are being bombarded with more information, more data than ever before. And without curiosity, I think we can begin to believe that what we see is all that there really is. And with curiosity, we can actually spin that information and that data into knowledge. And that's really the tool we need, given the fact that otherwise we're relying on cognitive biases and kind of retreating into our silos of sameness, but curiosity is the tool to actually spin this information into useful, into useful knowledge. Now, you, you, you have five steps, and I think we're actually gonna be able to cover the five steps, oh, I, cool. I do. At least just to get, give people a sense of it. Obviously, they're gonna, there's lots of exercises in the book on how to do this, we're not gonna go through that, but they're, they're all in there. But you say there's something that steps outside of the steps, and that's the fact of simply elevating curiosity, meaning that, you know, it has this power and you need to bring it to the forefront. Right, so elevating curiosity, just kind of a mental swap of elevating curiosity ahead of criticism, ahead of judgment, ahead of fear, and ahead of complacency. A friend of mine said, well, does elevating curiosity ahead of judgment make you less judgmental? And I thought, you know, it was a good question because judgmental is perceived to be a negative. But I said, no, really, elevating curiosity doesn't make you less judgmental, it makes you more accurate in your judgments, and that might be more important. But when you do it for yourself, there's something even more important it does. It makes you compassionate in your judgments. That's the problem when we, and that's what we'll get into, is because when we go inward, which is what we do when we are living curiously, if you do so without compassion for yourself, you are turning it into the opposite direction. That's the whole purpose, in fact, is to do it compassionately so that's when you could uncover without feeling bad, without having blame, without having any built-in prejudices that may already be within you from your upbringing. Yeah, it's really hard to be compassionate about others unless you have the self-compassion. And it doesn't mean letting yourself off the hook. It means looking curiously at what makes you do what you do. And, um, and I think a lot of people are fearful. I mean, it's, it's scary sometimes to be compassionate, you know, self-compassion. But I don't think that the opposite of fear is bravery, and I don't think the opposite of fear is curiosity. I actually think the opposite, sorry, I don't think the opposite of fear is bravery, and I don't think the opposite of fear is courage. 
I think the opposite of fear is curiosity. Would you even say that? The, and, and by the way, this goes back from our prehistoric roots. Fear is in that back limbic brain there, yes. and you know, it is the first thing that comes out. And when it does, it naturally, by the way, will choke curiosity. And in fact, you mentioned courage. In a sense, if you look at your fear with curiosity, then you can with break through and develop courage. That's actually the, the point, isn't it? Yeah, and understanding where our fear comes from. I mean, if you look at the political landscape, one of the easiest things to sell a human being is fear. And sometimes we have to check what's in our shopping cart. You know, are we buying fear? And if we are, can, why? Why are we so fearful of what, what's being sold to us? And we retreat into our silos of, I'm afraid of this, so I'm not curious about that, and I don't want to hear anything, anything new. Um, these cognitive biases get in the way of actually uncovering truths. Well, you even say, you say that living curiously is not this endless questioning and inquiry, but it is living curiously about what is important and uncovering what you need to know. And that does on the micro sense within the self, and as you said, politically, on the macro sense, and, and as we are bombarded on the fact of even finding out what is real and what isn't. It's, it's, you know, it's true. I think about people saying, you know, take a medical issue. I mean, curiosity can work for yourself in a medical setting. It can work in a business setting. It can certainly work in a, in a sense, uh, adventure setting. But, you know, in a medical setting, you hear a lot of people say, you know, you need to be an advocate for yourself medically. You need to be an advocate for yourself. But what does that mean? You know, what do you do to advocate for yourself? When someone, a doctor is giving you a litany of terminology, how do you stop and allow yourself to be curious, particularly if what the doctor is saying to you is calming and you don't want to question or unnerving and you do. So being curious and elevating curiosity ahead of fear can have a lot of practical, just, I mean, it could potentially save your life. Well, another thing that you say how it can save your life is in the face of panic. Because in panic, the first thing that again shuts down is you're not about to think curiously. You're either fighting or, f or flighting, however you want fight or flight right. system kicks in. But if you can, in times of extreme stress, pause for even that split second, think curiously about what is causing everything, you have a better chance of surviving it. And I don't even mean if it's life or death. I mean even if it's just simply a panic attack you have a better chance of getting through it. Yeah, it's true. And so many things that we that calm us down can be misleading. In other words, something that makes us feel calm might be some might produce the exact environment where curiosity can flourish. Whereas we tend to be less curious if we are seeking just calm and certainty. When when we have that calm and certainty, um, that might be the time to actually elevate curiosity versus say, okay, check, I've, I'm calm and I'm certain. But you know, and, and I love the fact that you give us the warning because if you didn't, I would. It's not easy to elevate curiosity. It's a practice. That's why you're making it your career now because you know that this is not something we tend to naturally do. You, as you write in the book, it's quicker and easier, as we discussed, to go to fear, to go to panic, to go to another state of mind than it is to elevate that state to curiosity. Yeah, and, and that's true. And really, curio there's kind of two kinds of curiosity. There's the curiosity we talk about, that childhood sense of wonder, that looking up at the stars, or what's this and what's that. And I call that free-range curiosity. But the strategic curiosity, the applied curiosity, almost like an applied science, is really using it to um, avoid blind spots and find hidden connections and live more adventurously. And that applied curiosity is an effort. It's not easy. And sometimes it leads you to feel comfortable with and acknowledge that you are wrong. And that's not always comfortable. Yes, but, but see, that's where that judgment and compassion have to come in, because if you don't, you're, you're going to go in the wrong direction. I know you don't want anyone, and you give enough exercises in here and enough steps to show how to avoid that, but that is important. Yeah, I mean, it really is. You have to cut yourself some slack, 
it's not hard, it's not easy to continue to elevate curiosity because sometimes when you're curious you reveal, oops, I'm wrong, or maybe some of the things that I believe or the assumptions I have should be challenged and busted. Let's go through some of the sure. steps. I think we might be able to do it. First one is start, and this is, and this again, talk about the, that's why it's not easy. Start with what you're not. The internal investigation that requires you to become curious about yourself. Right. So much of our society now is I'm all about what I'm all about. And even when you're tempted to sell or market your idea or your vision, it's hard not to, it's, hard, it's easy to talk about what you stand for. It's very difficult to come out and identify what you don't stand for. And frankly, who's your non-audience? What you, what you're trying to do, the good you're trying to do in the world is not for everyone. You're met, if it is, it's really for no one. So if you identify what you're not, what you don't stand for, and who is your non-audience, when you do identify what you are, it will have relevancy. It will have meaning. It will have more power. And again, you have to do it without stifling self-criticism, right. as you say. And you have to become comfortable with not knowing. When you're identifying what you don't know, that not knowing is okay. Right, and Mark Twain said, it's not what you know for sure, it's what you know for sure that just ain't so. Oh, beautiful. But not knowing, you say, also creates, these are your words, a lovely serendipity. Yeah, it does. I mean, if you acknowledge that you don't know, it gives you so much power over your vulnerability. You don't need, if you acknowledge that you don't know, you can decide what information gaps to fill or not. And until you identify what information gaps to fill and identify those in information gaps, the gap between what you want to know and what you need to know. And if you don't recognize that as a gap, there's no room for curiosity. So you absolutely have to acknowledge that you don't know to create the information gap in which curiosity can slip in. In the book, in fact, I actually, one of the, I told you this, I rarely have ever done this when an author comes on, I actually called you because I had a question about that and you said these words to me. You said, and it's, it's in the book as well, that if you, if you do that properly, you put that word but, if you say what you don't know first, but, this is what I do know, that but becomes a very loud but, and they actually hear more of what you really know when you acknowledge what you don't know first. Right, it's the blemishing effect. Actually, in the science of persuasion, it's the blemishing effect. And it, it works in an argument. If you, know, you throw everything in the kitchen sink in an argument and you're not willing to even acknowledge a weakness in your argument, then people won't listen. But if you can acknowledge a weakness in your argument, it elevates the other parts of your argument that you want to stand true to. You know, it's just like letting go of an assumption or two. It can make the others a little bit more meaningful. Same thing. Now, part of this introspective thing that you have to do if you want to live curiously is you say dumpster diving. The most useful and authentic and defining tidbits about you are often hidden in the dumpster of your life. So much of what makes us authentic are things that we're either embarrassed about, um, think are mundane or irrelevant or not fancy enough, but those are, those early conversations and those early experiences are the only things that you had that no one else had. And sometimes the things that are most traumatic and most embarrassing or even most mundane are the exact things that help us relate to other people. I mean, no one really likes to hear a story of someone who has succeeded in everything with every wonderful thing before them has always succeeded. People like to know that there are some stories from the dumpster of your life that may not be as impressive, and those are the areas where you can connect. And we need to go back and dumpster dive and extract those and be curious about those so that we can find what makes us unique. It also seems like by the nature of doing that, you would automatically also increase your empathy. Yes, absolutely. Because if you do go back, you stop believing your own publicity. You can go back to a story that you had, a simple story. And the fact that you remember the story is all, that's all that it's needed. That's all that's needed. It doesn't need to be some orchestrated story. 
if you remember some mundane story from the dumpster of your life, you can begin to see the mystique and the mundane in the lives of others. And that does elevate compassion. Now, part of part three, I'll go, we'll, we'll, actually, we are getting through some of these. Uh, step three is a term that you call cross-pollinate. And when you cross-pollinate, it does allow you to not necessarily bust your assumption as much as I would say makes you realize that your assumption may be wrong. Right. Because you've got now so many new streams of ideas from such a diverse uh, colony of ideas. Right, so that's colliding with fear-inducing and intrigue-inducing people and places. Cross-pollinating allows us to um, innovate. Cross-pollinating allows us to break our assumptions. Cross-pollinating allows us to see things that other people miss without retreating into our silos of sameness. Cross-pollinating may be how we eliminate divisiveness. Um, but it's not for predictable outcomes. Actually, cross-pollinating is for innovative outcomes. Cross-pollinating is for creating new things, new products, new ideas. It's not for predictable kinds of outcomes. It's, a, it's an interesting, it's, it's called life brokering. Well, you could see why, too, because as you are doing this, you're, you have to, again, be almost especially curious about your own assumptions. Right, 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 right. And that allows you to get the most out of these in colliding with fear-inducing and intrigue-inducing people and places. Because without that, without questioning your assumptions first, and without doing the preparatory work, without kind of understanding that you may be wrong, and looking for opportunities and hidden connections through people that may be in places that may be very different from what you are used to, um, you can't get the most out of living curiously. Now, the fourth step, and, and this is one, I'll, I'll share the story with people, but I first want you to define it. It's find uncommon commonalities. And these are powerful connections that come from finding these uncommon commonalities, but I need you to first explain even what are uncommon commonalities. So in the, in the, when you're, no good ideas just don't happen to a person alone. So a lot of times when you're trying to do good things in the world, good stuff in the world, you need to rally people to your cause. You need to have allies. And in order to do that, a lot of people would say, you need to find things that are in common. You find things that are in common with people. And that kind of seems obvious. But it's the power of uncommon commonalities that really work. And for example, you're walking down the street and you see someone with a, you know, a, you're, you go to University of Texas and you see someone with a hook and horn t-shirt. And you say, okay, you know, you're in Texas at, in Austin. That's a commonality. You're both wearing a hook and horn t-shirt. You're in Amsterdam and you see someone with a hook and horn t-shirt. You're probably going to go up and say, hey, you know, that's an uncommon commonality. It's a simple example, but also finding these uncommon commonalities is always available. And to do it strategically, authentically, not as a manipulative kind of exercise, but a way to connect, um, in a way to um, rally people to good causes by looking and finding them strategically is a very powerful, and it's, pow it's, it's actually in the literature of persuasive science. But that was what I was going to say when I, that was the sec, I called you twice, I'll never forget, because I was saying I had a meeting coming up and it says it's best to st strategically reveal the uncommon commonality before you even begin. And I said, but how do you find the uncommon commonality if you haven't even met the person yet? The, the good news is, and it seems kind of stalkerish, and I don't mean this to sound stalkerish, but the good news is a lot of people have social profiles, so you can meet people virtually, just like you can go places virtually. I mean, Living Curiously doesn't require resources. You can go online, you can look and see what you have in common with people, you can talk to their friends. Um, I don't think there's ever been a time where we can find uncommon commonalities easier than we can today. The one thing, you and you hinted at this before, when you do this even, you must pers pursue this with a sense of ethics. If you're doing it without that, and, and in fact, you, because you, you specialize even in helping people with sales and in business, you say sales done right is nothing short of noble. Right. And so therefore, we can't think of that. If you're doing sales right, and I know people who are great salespeople, they do it out of a nobleness because they feel 
they have something that really is important for you. And those are the people that make the best salespeople. Yes, I mean, if the exchange, if using persuasive techniques, if using curiosity as a strategic tool, and these persuasive techniques allow this exchange to leave both the seller and the recipient of that selling skill in a beneficial situation, then there's nothing more noble. There's nothing more noble than that. It's when sales becomes a four-letter word, or I guess sale becomes a four-letter word, it's because the intent is not right. And if your intent is not right, then you should stay away from the persuasive arts and probably living curiously. Let's go to number five, and I still have some other things besides, so even if we have time left, hopefully we will, I can cover them. BLAST, that's what number five is, and it stands for Blunder, Learn, Accumulate, Successes, and Try Again. So, and you even love that term blunder instead of failure. It's, it's easier to view it as a blunder than a failure. Yeah, there's this whole thing about failure. There's a finality in failure that can be intimidating. There is a lot in the, you know, in current literature about failing, fail fast, fail sideways, fail forward. Blunder seems like you're stumbling around. And when you stumble, it seems easier to kind of scrape among the debris to try to accumulate successes. And blundering, I think, is beautiful because it requires you to step off the bleachers and into the arena to move from, being a move from being a spectator to a participant. So you don't have to blunder if you're a spectator, but you do have to blunder if you're, gonna, you're going to be a participant in doing good. And so I like that because it doesn't have the finality of failure, and I also feel like it leaves room for actually getting in there and accumulating the successes, successes that you can miss without using curiosity strategically. And the, again, we go back to the fear. What you say is, and that's why this blunder thought rather than failure thought is important, because we have a natural fear when we ask, and what is asking questions but living curiously, that we're dumb. It, right. And it prevents us, in a sense, from really getting smart. And even when we're judging other people's failures, or blunders, I would call them blunders, if we say that that's a failure, we fail to see what might be hidden successes from other people's blunders. And then we can't extract the lessons from other people's blunders. We just have to rely on our own. And that's really limiting our opportunity to learn. You end with this thing called the quit-fail conundrum. And this is the one I had a, this is the one that I had a little problem grasping because, you know, when you're struggling to, to want to never give up, that conundrum then, and you don't want people to give up, but you, you do have this quit-fail conundrum. Explain that and how you see it working when it comes to living curiously. Well, I thought about the whole never quit, or quitting is the easiest thing to do, and I thought, well, tell that to me with a half a pitch of margaritas and a half a bowl of chips in front of me. It ain't that easy. But these platitudes can get in the way of our really understanding when is quitting failure and when is failing to quit failure. And there is a measurement that you can use curiosity strategically to do that, and that is analyzing sunk costs and opportunity costs. So sunk costs being things you've already invested in that you're never gonna get back, whether you proceed or not, and opportunity costs, which is the cost of doing the best, next best alternative. So, you know, going to the movies, I'm sitting in this really crappy movie, but I've spent 15 bucks and I've got my popcorn and I'm sitting there and I'm thinking, I hate this, but I've already spent the $15 on the movie. Well, I should be analyzing the opportunity costs. What am I not able to do because I'm sitting in this movie? And sunk costs are a lot easier to see because they're about the past. An opportunity cost requires some level of curiosity and prediction. So that conundrum, that quit-fail conundrum, can be answered sometimes with curiously looking at sunken opportunity costs. Oftentimes, our life decisions, they may not be as easy to, to separate like that, and one sometimes doesn't know and it is hard to figure out, do you keep going or do you not? Stop asking the question rhetorically and then you can start curiously extricating, or excuse me, excavating 
the reasons and, the, and what it would look like. Just like what does success, what would it look like if you couldn't fail? Becky, you, you live a curious life and I'm gonna end with your curious words. The crazy thing is that it's only when we finally realize how little we know, which we spoke about before, that we actually become smarter. Thank you, Becky, for helping us gain knowledge and wisdom today. Thank you so much. Uh, it's my pleasure, and thank you all for joining us. Now, before Becky leaves, I'd like to leave you with these few more words from Living Curiously. When what you think you know about your life collides with the pesky truth of reality, living curiously could be the best remedy. I'm Barry Kibrick. Curiosity lives in that space between what we think we know and reality. Feel comfortable living curiously, for it is the best remedy to connect the two together. Thank you, Becky, so much. Thanks. Closed captioning for Between the Lines with Barry Kibrick is made possible by your generous contributions to KLCS Education Foundation. Thank you for your support. To connect with Barry, like us on Facebook and follow us on Twitter at Barry Kibrick. And to contact Barry directly, watch past episodes of Between the Lines, and read his blog, visit us at barrykibrick.com.